back to another episode of Sound Bites. My name is Bill Bench. I'm your host. And today I'm excited to introduce our guest, Gene Grosser, Chief Business Officer of Stripe. Gene's background, she started her career at Google where she spent the good part of a decade learning a lot of skills before making a shift over to a smaller company in Dialpad where she joined as Chief Revenue Officer and led their go-to-market operations. Then she made her next move, joining Stripe in the early years and through a number of roles has ascended up to the Chief Business Officer position that she's in today. I'd like to highlight a couple of key areas we'll explore with Jean. We'll talk about the importance of company values when you're selecting the next organization that you go work for. We'll talk about consumption versus recurring models and the pros and cons of that. We'll talk about interchange fees and the marginal implication and costs associated with that model. And we'll talk about Gene's famous Buffalo strategy. So welcome to the episode. I look forward to diving into it with Gene. Welcome everybody. My name is Bill Bench. I am an operating partner here at Battery Ventures. We started this podcast a couple of years ago to touch on all things related to go to market. And with that, I'm really excited to introduce our guest for this series podcast. It's Gene Grosser, the Chief Business Officer at Stripe. Hello, Gene. Hello, Bill. Great to have you here. So Jean has a non-linear path to her role inside of Stripe today. She started her career at Google where she did a couple of stints, two four-year stints inside of the business before pursuing her MBA in the middle of that. And then like a lot of people that begin their career in very large organizations, she made a shift and decided to go to a smaller organization and joined Dialpad, a traditional software SaaS company as their chief revenue officer, where she led that for a couple of years before making yet another shift to go to another smaller and dare I say in 2016, much lesser known version of what Stripe is today. Is that correct, Jean? I guess accurate for sure. (laughs) All right, good. Well, let's dive in to the topics here. We won't start back in the Google years, but Dialpad, you went and you earned your chops as the top sales leader inside of, like I said, a traditional SaaS software business where you skilled up on leading teams, on leading sales, on running a sales organization, designing a sales organization. But after a couple of years, you made what I think a lot of people would look at and say is probably a a risky move of going to a much smaller version of what Stripe is compared to today and how well it's known. What was the motivation behind making that move? I think when I left Google, I was pretty clear on why I was leaving, but I wasn't as clear about what had kept me at Google for a decade. And when I reflected on making another career move, I spent a lot more time figuring out if I go to another company, what will keep me at that company for a decade? And it boiled down to three things. One, I needed there to be a strong values-based culture that was really aligned with the principles I care about. Two, was I wanted it to employ world-class engineers because being a technology leader was important to me. And three was I wanted the company to be playing in a really large market um, so that you could sustain the type of growth rate that would allow me to be there for 10 years. And so for Stripe, Claire Johnson was the COO at the time. She had been actually my first boss at Google when I was 22. I had watched a bunch of podcasts, interviews, et cetera, with John and Patrick. And so I felt very confident that I would have good values alignment with the culture they were building from everything I could see and that what Stripe was bringing to market with its developer orientation, people I'd met, it seemed to me that they were hiring nerdy engineers, which, you know, I wanted to see former PhDs and folks doing ML and whatnot. And then arguably payments is one of the largest horizontal markets on the planet. So I felt pretty confident that you could continue to play in that sandbox for a pretty long time. That's great. One of the things that I love about talking with professionals who start their career at larger organizations is a lot of times you have a tremendous amount of training and frameworks drilled into you. And it's just fascinating to hear you talk about the values culture, you know, something that everybody I think outside of Google knows is a very strong element of the organization. 
clearly engineering. It's a very engineering first type of organization. And then just like Google is a very large market, uh, you're right about payments, which is a great segue into me asking you this question. So you went from a B2B application that sells in a traditional SaaS methodology to making a switch to essentially selling an API that is used by developers. What did you see there? Or was it just the large market, the engineering first culture, the values, or was there something in the buyer persona or the ICP that you recognized? You know, this was, so this was 2015 that I was exploring companies. And so developer tools were really taking off and it felt to me that way was going to sustain um, and that I, it would be interesting to be at a company in the forefront of that. Um, so I think I, I also interviewed at the time at GitHub to give you a sense of sort of where my head was at of like, okay, what are the leading developer tools companies? So that, that was one of them. That was probably the only really smart insight, to be honest, beyond the three I just outlined. I do think I was picking a little like less specifically on like, okay, I want to get into API or, you know, any, anything along those lines. But when I did interview at Stripe, I think I was, I only interviewed with five companies. One was a series A company. I generally knew I wanted to be at a more mature company than that, but I really liked that founder. Um, and then um, another one was just had a really strong VC intro. It sort of piqued my interest. And then the other three were Stripe, Gib, GitHub, and Slack. <laughs> so give you a sense. <laughs> Uh, I get a sense that uh, you choose well is the sense that I get. Um, all great companies, and I'm sure the other one with the great founder probably is pretty successful. Um, so staying on this thread around Stripe and the model of interchange fees, which really, if you think about it, you know, a lot of companies today are making a shift away from like user-based type of pricing and are going to much more of a consumption base. That's really what, if you think about interchange fees is, how was your learning curve for adjusting from going from a traditional, like I said, like a probably dial pad, I'm guessing was a SaaS a seat based type of subscription. How was that learning curve and the process for you to pick up that understanding on the side of the business of Stripe? Yeah. So Stripe was really interesting because it's actually got two dynamics. So one, it was a consumption based business model, which, you know, about a decade ago was pretty novel. Um, that wasn't, people were still very much on the, the licensed recurring fee. Now it's getting a little bit more mainstream. So tons of implications that we can get into for how you think about forecasting, how you think about deal constructs, comp models, target setting, like everything I knew that was best in class at the time was really geared around, you know, a per seat license model that was relatively predictable revenue and consumption wasn't. And then the other thing that was really interesting was you had an actual underlying cost, which right. is interchange. So, you know, most software companies are, you know, 80 plus percent gross margins, zero, you know, zero marginal cost. Uh, not actually the case with Stripe. Um, you can have two users doing the exact same thing on your platform and actually cost you fundamentally different amounts of money. And so that actually just meant having like a far deeper appreciation of sort of the P&L implications for customers you would choose to work with, which I think is interesting now with this day and age, if you see more of those, Twilio arguably has similarities. Um, parts of AI may, where like, it's expensive to do this compute. Right. Um, so I, I sort of see, you know, consumption has become more mainstream. And then this whole lack of zero marginal cost is also something that people are starting to have to grapple with. Yeah, it's interesting. I, you're right. Most sales leaders out there in the SaaS world really run a revenue business. And it's interesting. In my experience, I've had a couple of leaders approach me and say, I really want to run a P&L. And I, I always look at them and say, are you sure? You sure you want to run that cost side? And it's interesting that you've got thrust into that situation just based on the fact that there is, like you said, the cost basis of delivering the interchange fees. Yeah, like Bill, just to give you a good example of this, like I literally had to make the business case at one point for uh, like fundamentally re-architecting part of how our API worked because of the cost associated in that case, not with interchange, but with incremental AWS calls that when you run the type of margin business that Stripe does actually add up and make it so that like some of the largest customers on the planet couldn't run profitably on Stripe. So typically like not a revenue leader's job to go and like advocate for like, could you lower our AWS bill, <laughs> you right. know, but in, in this type of business, actually you have to think about that. 
hundred uh, percent. That is the role of a revenue executive, not the sales leader, right? Many situations in my past career where I've come in and made the right decision for the company that are decisions that the sales team looks at you kind of quizzically and says, boss, why, why'd you do that? And you're forced to do that type of situation. Uh, staying on this, you mentioned AI real quickly with the surge of AI, I would make an assumption that that's also got a big impact on the increasing cost structure. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, I mean, we're, we're doing a ton with AI at Stripe. A lot of it actually is both not cheap, but also reducing costs. So I think Stripe was pretty early to market and using AI quite deeply for support uh, reasons. You can imagine we get a huge number of support inquiries that are relatively complicated, actually. So we've been able to take millions of dollars out of our support costs um, by using AI. Similarly, we use it heavily in, you know, in payments. You've got to know your customer, know your business. And so you actually need to figure out this random entity on the web. Are they, are they real and are they good? Right. Turns out LLMs are, are great at that. And so again, not, not cheap to run them, but it, it, I think once we get them fully optimized, we'll be cheaper than also employing cheaper and even actually more accurate than employing thousands and thousands of humans to go individually look at websites when traditional machine learning wasn't working. 100%. And it's great to hear you operationalizing, or let me use the past tense version, operationalized some of that already, because I do think that a lot of companies are going through that process of maybe just now moving out of experimentation and starting to figure out how to put that that in. A um, whole other topic that we could go into, but uh, you did bring something up a few minutes ago that I want to go back to, which was the sophistication of a go-to-market model. You mentioned how to forecast, how to target customers, how to create deal structures for your buyers, being able to compensate your sales reps once a deal has been done. I'd love to dive into that. I think maybe a, a question that I always think about is a tip of the spear is quota setting is how do you think about that? Because knowing that Stripe sells to the smallest of small companies up to the largest of the, the e-commerce companies out there in the world, how do you think about when you're building a compensation model for the organization, what are the couple of the top tenants that you think through? Well, what on, on that point of like smallest of startups to largest of enterprises, obviously segmentation is, is key and we can get into that uh, more later. What was interesting for us, and we matured a lot uh, over the last eight years, was when I started, again, consumption-based business model, the concept of committed contract, relatively anathema, um, and payments in particular, that had just never been a way that people bought. Um, and so you truly were usage-based consumption, right? Like we took people's money when they use the product and, you know, you could ask them how much they were going to use, but at the end of the day, you knew how much they were going to use when they used it. So you can imagine that made it hard to come up with targets and forecast. Um, and so we actually did a really interesting thing out of the gates, um, which was right. we, you, I mean, you technically couldn't book revenue. Um, and so, you know, when you'd go to Salesforce and, you know, normally we'd all move it to closed one, we called that deal signed just to reinforce to our sales team that like, you just, you didn't book anything. <laughs> like we may or may not get any revenue from that. All you did was sign a contract. And now we right. actually need to go make good on helping that um, user integrate, get live and ultimately ramp their revenue. And so what was really interesting was like early days Stripe, we actually gold people and paid people. And we still do to varying degrees on revenue, like true revenue. There was a hundred percent alignment between company outcomes and the sales team outcomes. But what that meant was, is within this quarter, what I'm doing from a sales perspective is building future quarter revenue. Um, and so it's always an interesting dynamic of, you know, most sales orgs out there, you can have your end of quarter push and, you know, you can throw discounts to get deals over the line. And you like really couldn't do that because anything you did within quarter right. typically was again, creating something for anywhere between 90 and 180 days from now. So you had to get really sophisticated actually from a data perspective of, understanding sort of post uh, post signing deal dynamics um you know what percent of our deals ever went live because in startup land they don't always how quickly were they going to ramp on with what frequency would you have a breakout for example 
Lime, if everybody remembers Lime Bikes, <laughs> that that company made our startup quota for an entire year, that sure. single company, because it was such a breakout. So we had to get it all good at all of those things. Now we're more sophisticated and actually are bringing more committed contracts to bear. Um, so you get more revenue predictability, which is, you know, made it a little bit easier and a bit more like traditional SaaS sales. All right, let's break those two apart there. So going back, it sounds like if I heard you correctly, then there's some difficulty in some target setting and then in conversation. So it, I'm assuming you made a look back like every month or every quarter or something like that. You would align the sales rep that deal signed was great. Good job. You, you got your foot in the door. But now what we need to do is make that customer successful by getting them up live and launching. And once they're live and launching and using Stripe, then the fees are coming through and that's where you're going to retire some quota and then get paid. Yeah, that's still largely what we do today. There's a little bit on the committed contract because like now it, it is in fact bookable, but the bulk of how Stripe salespeople are paid is on actual revenue. Um, and so again, it also just creates extreme alignment between us and our customers, which is if the customer's super successful, they ought to be processing a lot of revenue on us and then our salespeople get paid well. Um, and so it actually requires your sales force to also be more sophisticated about how your business actually works. Um, and so their dashboards are pretty darn different than your typical Salesforce dashboard, where, again, you know what you signed this quarter, and then we help project that into the future of if you did a good deal, if it does what you've input into Salesforce, then, you know, six months from now, it should output this revenue and it'll cover that future quota of yours effectively. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a different mental model for a sales salesperson. For sure. And this, this leads us into, I know, an area that, that you and I chat about previously about the two things that are versions of segment, the enterprise segment, and then going international. Um, let's talk about the enterprise here for a second. Early days, you came in and you just mentioned Lime as an example, a uh, really successful customer for you. A lot of your business was in that down market, but you specifically drove a push to move up market and into the enterprise. Uh, I'd love to have you share with the audience a little bit about that detail. So there's sort of two things I did. Um, one was move up market from like an adjacent perspective. Um, so folks have probably, if anybody's heard me talk before, I was like my buffalo strategy, which was a, an animal that is larger than, you know, large, but not a whale, <laughs> um, which was <laughs> effectively like, okay, we're mostly selling into a series B. Let's go find series uh, C, D, E companies. Because if you looked at Stripe's growth aspirations, there were, was no way, there just weren't enough series B companies on the planet for us to be able to sustain the growth rates that you know Patrick and company were looking for. So that was sort of stage one. And then stage two was a, a lot of startups out there will just like Stripe be happily selling to your series B, C startup, and then somehow get a random traditional enterprise who buys your stuff. And I kind of ignored it at first because I was like, man, like a lot of these aren't that interesting. Like I'm not seeing a ton of pattern between them. And when I stopped saying that was when Amazon <laughs> bought from us um, and bought from us for the entire Singapore market. So not their main U.S. market, um, but, you know, wasn't a toy side pro project. So to me, the fact that we could actually get through a contract process with Amazon and they would use us in a way that like Jeff Bezos would know if that was a bad decision, right, meant that there had to be a there there. Um, and so what we, but I would say I was also at Google when, so I worked in what ultimately became Google Enterprise, um, but 2010 through 2014. And um, I worked on, it was called Google Apps then, now Google Workplace, but Google had a thing where very, very early on, like 2012, Genentech and Land Rover did wall-to-wall -wall deployments of Gmail for work. And everyone was like, oh my God, massive enterprise business, let's go. And we probably spent four years wasting our time pouring Lord knows how many millions of dollars into selling into enterprise when we actually weren't enterprise ready. And you had had two blips that were like visionaries, right? And so I really remembered that from Google because we had, to, we laid people off. We had to do a big pivot to basically be like, we actually only have S&P mid-market fit and we got to go build into enterprise. And so I didn't want us to repeat that at Stripe. And so we were very, very systematic, again, about sitting down and being like, where do we win today? Like, where is our sweet spot? And does a sweet spot of that shape exist within an enterprise? And so we figured out our Connect product was really compelling. Um, platforms and marketplaces use that. 
large enterprises often had a platform or a marketplace business model. Um, and so we went out and we started actually by creating a lighthouse list. It was 30 named users that we wanted to pursue, got buy-in out of the gates from Patrick and our engineering team that, hey, if we go out and talk to these 30 enterprises and they have a need that like we all agree is a legitimate one, you will build for them because that's the other thing a lot of startups struggle with when you move up market is rarely do they buy precisely the current shape of your product. <laughs> We actually, at that time, spun up um, a lighthouse engineering team. It was five people and a product manager. They accompanied me on all the sales calls um, so they could hear firsthand these enterprise asks. And then they embedded with our engineering teams when we needed to spin up something for enterprise. And then we took a plan to the board um, that basically, you know, we laid out, we we're going to start with five reps, wasn't a big investment. Here's how much it would cost. Um, you know, here's what we think you would want our unit economics to look like such that if we hit this, you will definitely let us go have the sixth, seventh and eighth rep. And then we, we went at it, um, you know, and every 90 days we did a report out either to, you know, Patrick and co or, or the board. And, um, you know, that's, that's the beginning. I can't at, on any level say that the rest is history. Although I can now say after years and years of a lot of other great leaders contributing, um, Stripe actually now earns the majority of its revenue from large public enterprises. This is a great tale, Gene, um, and so analogous to, I think, a lot of companies. You know, my experience at Marketo had some similarities to that in the sense that we started off as a SMB, and I'll emphasize the S in SMB. I mean, it was small, like fifteen, sixteen thousand dollar $16,000 a year deals focused on startups. And that's what we got renowned for. And it was interesting about eight years after the founding of the company, we found that we were selling to small, mid and enterprise and to develop a product that does all of those all the time is hard. And we knew that our future, much like you shared at Stripe was you're going to run out of companies on the low end. We needed to go to the enterprise to drive the type of growth that we wanted also meant we needed to drive the product. And so when we made that shift, not every company de deploys the same strategy, but we deployed a strategy where we actually moved away from the SMB because we knew that our product was going to become more feature heavy. It was going from a single product to becoming a platform, uh, a lot of changes. And we said, instead of fighting all these battles, we're just going to go pursue a specific end of the market. And like yourself, I wouldn't say it was history, but obviously Marketo was acquired by a PE firm and then was sold to Adobe. And they mostly focus on the high end of town around that. So I think if I summarize what I heard you say, which like I said, is I think a fairly common tale inside of Silicon Valley around software companies and their growth. But if I think I hear what you're saying there is you, your experience from Google led you to be very cautious and deliberate about the approach from the product perspective going upwards. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. I think the other thing too was, um, you know, a lot of startups in Silicon Valley struggle with sales and sort of sales organization feeling culturally different. And you can have this real divide between, you know, an engineering product led organization and layering and sales. And that was another thing I was like very sensitive to was I worked at an engineering led company, I did not work at a sales led company. <laughs> and so you needed to approach selling into this different type of, of customer in a way that brought, brought engineering along for the ride. And so it was not going to work for me to go out and land a $10 million deal and force it down the throats, you know, of, of a team or a company that didn't otherwise want to do that deal. They needed to be part of the process and seeing the opportunity and learning about that user segment and wanting to serve it and believing that it was core to Stripe's future. Got it. That makes sense. We'll dive a little bit more deeply here into the segmentation, but before we go into that, one question I'm just curious about is going back to the whole marginal implication of what you sell is that you don't set the price for what interchanges fees are across different geos, different countries and things like that. I'm curious from a, a planning and a org design perspective, how you and your strategy and your planning team think about that, you know, like, cause I think to give an, an analogy to that would be that a lot of companies think, okay, I'm going to segment by small, mid market, large, I'm going to segment by country. And then each one of those specific pods or silos gets a, 
a uh, number of wraps, a quota per wrap, a cost per wrap, that type of thing. But I th I'm going to make an assumption here that yours is probably a bit more sophisticated than that based on the fact that you don't control all the variables that go into that. Yeah. Um, so basically, like our sales team operates off uh, net revenue. So we make a bunch of revenue. A lot of that we give back to the visas and the MasterCards of the world. Uh, and then we keep the net revenue. And so we have to do a lot of work actually to net, net that out. And then once you do that, it's not overly dissimilar um, from more of like a typical model. Um it's still got nuance because there are some costs that we actually pass through. So when you're working with an enterprise, a lot of interchange is just passed through um, to the enterprise. And so you're really just marking up the stripe margin and that's what you negotiate when you're at the lower end of the market market uh, market and it's blended like the two, nine and 30 that stripe is famous for, obviously the underlying costs are then baked in. And so that was actually an interesting experience I had at stripe in my early days was uh, you know, again, we're working with small customers. Uh, we've got this headline price point of two nine and thirty that Stripe was famous for, but these startups would grow and they wouldn't want to pay two nine and thirty anymore. And so you'd have to get in these repricing conversations. And so at the beginning of my career was in operations. So I was like, man, this is inefficient. Like I ought to just be able to auto reprice these guys as they grow. Of like, okay, if you're doing a million dollars in volume, you can now have two eight and thirty. And if you're doing ten million, it can be two seven and thirty, or you know whatever the case may be. And so we go to do that and it turns out all these uh, customers of ours were wildly unprofitable. It actually was costing us like three, five and 30 <laughs> to have them be Stripe customers. Um, and it was because Stripe actually didn't understand all of the underlying costs. Uh, and so I ended up uh, driving like multi-quarter project to change aspects of our pricing to sort of pass some of these things that really changed the underlying costs through to users so that you could sort of smooth out that curve um, and have more efficient pricing. So sort of another interesting example, kind of going back to the top of our conversation, we're like, you know, at my, my job was a revenue leader, but I ended up being sort of like our first pricing team because if I was going to make Stripe as much money as I would like to, it needed to be efficiently priced. <laughs> this is great content, Gene. Uh, first of all, going back to the Buffalo strategy, this podcast is called Sound Bites. That's a sound bite in its own. <laughs> I love the mindset there and the, the 2930 price basis, but then learning your business and learning that, that, Hey, we're charging X, but it actually costs us X plus to, pro to support or provide for that customer, um, is a, is a great, uh, I think other type of takeaway from young company growth, because I've been part of the same thing where I've had finance people knocking on my door saying this customer is not profitable. And like I said, when you are a traditional revenue head in a SaaS software company, you're like, Hey, my job was to go land the customer, right? Like you guys set the pricing, you give me the ball and I go put the ball in the hoop, right? <laughs> you know, like that's really my role, but, um, same thing. Like when you roll into, or when you grow into a, a revenue executive role, now you have to think about that. You have to adjust your thought process and say, look, I'm just not going to go slam a bad deal that gets a bunch of people paid, but the company's losing money on. Yep. Absolutely. Like I said, really, really great stuff. One last question on this, and then we can switch to, well, actually, this is probably a nice uh, segue into segmentation. But so let's say today I joined Stripe as a uh, more senior rep, meaning enterprise or whatever, one of your top tiers. And I come in and I inherit some book of business that the expectation is I'm going to go grow that book of business. Going back to our conversation about how you build targets and how you compensate that, is the model something like I come in and the current run rate is X and my goal is to grow it by X plus some percentage? We have been through a lot of iterations and go to market. Um, so first of all, we segment the sales org not only by your typical size within, um, uh, within a segment though, we further segment sort of three additional ways. Uh, one is traditional enterprise versus digital native. We find they buy differently. They have different needs. I think that's like a fairly common thing that people seem to be replicating as of late. And then sort of third actually is like pretty clear line between greenfield and install base. Uh, and we've tried the life cycle model of sort of, you know, a blended territory or like you're doing some greenfield while growing others and have found that 
you know, if you are still in market share acquisition mode, there's nothing like having people who can only make their number by acquiring new customers. So we've cordoned that off. In that case, you're getting a patch. You know, in some cases, you might have like a teeny tiny bit of business, but nothing material. Um, and so you're going out and you're hardcore hunting. For the install base, it's a bit of a mix. Like it depends on the territory size. We have some territories that are, you know, one account or three accounts. In those cases, the quota is like, can be pretty specific actually to that user and our understanding of their current growth trajectory, what they haven't bought from us that they ought to, because we now have multiple products that you can sell into a customer. When you get down into territories that have anywhere between 15 and, you know, a hundred odd accounts, it's, it's a little bit more about incremental right. growth and we'll use data science to try to create patches that not only are alike, you know, it's, it's better to go sell the 30 minute little slacks every day than like, you know, one slack, one Ford, you know, one, whatever. So sort of both look alike and distribution of growth opportunity. That makes sense. And, and your segmentation, do you, you might use a few vectors I'm guessing, but is it mostly driven by employee size, by estimated GMV or something like that? What is the, the key metric that you utilize to do that? Yeah, more the latter, because for payments in particular, you can have small companies that do outsized volume, particularly if they're a marketplace or a platform business model. And we, one of the things I think we were really thoughtful about in the early days, and I credit Claire for this because she sort of saw this at, at Google, was you really want to tie your segmentation to potential, not to current spend. So we do our best to um, segment along the lines of like ultimate likely spend with Stripe. Sometimes employees is a proxy for that. The challenge with that type of segmentation is obviously data availability. So we'll use employees as an input and a fallback when you, you know, you don't have known revenue, but we too, do try to get more at uh, spend potential. Understood. That's great. A um, couple more for you here. We've seen in the, the SaaS software space, the rise of revenue operations over the last several years. You know, we've always had expediters or sales ops support type of thing, but you've really seen revenue operations come into its own. I would have to make an assumption based on our conversation here that you probably would have a pretty sophisticated planning and revenue strategy team inside of Stripe. Is that accurate? Uh, it is, although I will say we were grossly underinvested in this for years. Um, we sort of started out strong and then for a bit, like did not keep investment in that, those functions in, uh, at pace with our growth. And we've been paying that debt down for a couple of years. I, when I meet with startup founders, I'm like, do you employ five sales reps? Great. Get your first sales leader and get that person a sales ops or rev ops leader. I am like a massive, massive proponent for having a really strong analytical arm. The one I actually had, um, we, uh, was that I would meet weekly with wasn't just my rev ops lead. It was finance and data science, the four of us would meet every week to sort of cover all of my analytical needs. <laughs> I love this. Um, so sales, rev ops, data science, and finance. I think I hear about this all the time, Gene, that some of the best run companies have that exact same mindset out there where they're employing the usage of all those teams to figure out where the puck is going to. As we, as we all say, you know, going back to what you said about the underinvestment, I think that's been perpetual. And I agree with you wholeheartedly on the investment of you, you get five, six sales reps, you need a sales manager for them, and then you need somebody to support that person. And that's becoming a weapon out there right now for the best companies that are, that are employing that. I'm seeing CROs come into companies now. And as they're going through the interview process, they alert the team that I'm a package deal, that I come in the door with another person to come help me run the business. It's their consigliere of revenue, if you will. Yeah, yeah, totally. The number of like founders I've spoken to that are trying to figure out their like CRO strategy. And after I talk to them for 30 minutes, I'm like, your, your bigger problem might be actually you fundamentally don't have RevOps. <laughs> Um, so I, that's like one of, I I'm constantly referring good rev ops leaders to the founders I work with. It, it's so true. I remember in the early days of Marketo, we were just doing outsized business and being really successful despite, you know, a lot of the challenges that, that might've been out there. And I remember one of our board members kept telling me, Bill, I'd, I'd invest in sales training. I'd invest in sales operations. Uh, 
I was too smart for that. I was like, Hey, I got this. And you see the numbers we're putting up here. We're doing really well. And then, like you said, that debt piled up and then suddenly you wake up one day and you're like, Holy smokes, is this heavy? I have the way of the world on my shoulders on these things that we're not doing. You know, the days that I used to train sales reps through osmosis and through them sitting and hearing me and the other reps on the floor, we've all are in different locations. Now we're all on different calls. We're in conference rooms. That's not happening. And so the reps aren't growing yep. like they used to, or, you know, we're bringing reps on and they don't have well-defined territories. Their comp plans aren't, aren't there. All of the elements that go with revenue operations. And now whenever I see that guy, I go up to him and I give him a hug and I say, did I ever tell you about how you were right? And he'll be like, you tell me every time you see me, Bill, I'll be like, can I give you another hug? <laughs> cause, yeah. cause, cause he was so right about it. Totally. Well, I think beyond RevOps too, like my goal as a revenue leader was always, I want it to be exceedingly obvious that the next incremental dollar should go into my revenue org. And that was why I also had finance and data science involved, you know, data science to help me create the most efficient sales org that I, you know, could, could run and finance also so that uh, like I got to a point where the finance team was better at pitching my budget asks than I was like, I'd go to our annual planning process and they'd be like, no, 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 we already, we already briefed the C CFO. He's on board. <laughs> like you're good. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you can have your finance team advocating for your budget asks, I think you're in a good place. <laughs> That's functional alignment right there. And it's great to hear that, that they and you were thinking of that way, because I think a lot of companies do think if there's one incremental dollar, do we put it into sales? But I think the mistake that happens there is a lot of times people immediately say it goes into a quota carrying dollar, which as we know, a quota carrying role needs support. You have management, you have maybe SDRs, you have sales engineers, you have rev ops and sales trainers and things like that. And so I think you need to think about it holistically at a slightly higher level, as opposed to just, you know, another incremental body goes in and becomes a quota carrier. Oh, yes. Couldn't agree more. We had our, like, there's sometimes this allergy, I think, to the concept of ratios because like folks in finance or, uh, you know, a founder don't love the idea of like, this thing is always going to scale and, you know, are we actually pushing ourselves to get increasingly efficient? Um, but we definitely got to a point at Stripe where we had, you know, our ratio of quota carriers to all the things you need to make them efficient was, was off and it might look good on paper, but it does not an efficient rep make. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think that's it. I think we've covered a lot of ground Gene, here in the last 40 minutes or so. So uh, I want to be respectful and appreciative of your time. So thank you for joining the second sound bites of 2024. We're really excited to have you come join us. So appreciate your time. Awesome. Thanks so much, Bill. Always a pleasure. You bet.